Yeah, asking me to speak about retail is, is really uh, just a great gift because I just love what I'm talking about because it's the only thing I know. And, and, and uh, let's see if this all works. Yeah, what I'm going to talk about today is the return of romantic relationships to retail. And while that may seem a little bit of a metaphorical stretch, um, I don't think it is because retail is not clicks and bricks. It's not transactions. It's not experiences or anything like that. Retail is really all about love. So right off the bat, you guys know your experience and you're, you're obviously capable of being great retailers because you know everything about love. And that's all you need to know. The retail was built on romance. If you go back to the first retailers, the, the uh, Marcuses, the, the, the Neemans, the Bloomingdales, they loved their merchandise. They loved what they believed in. They, it, was, it was their passion. And they pursued that passion. And the customers basically, you know, I love it, was everything you hear at the retail store. That was what drove you to buy. But along the way, retailers lost that loving feeling. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'll go into some of them tonight. But the good news is, there's an app for that. <laughs> okay? And so the reason the retail romance is back is because we now know how to, well, we'll talk, I'm ahead of myself. Sephora, for example, many of you know, developed this app where you could try the makeup on at home. You could see your face with it. Now, how many of you used it? Yes, you got it. Yeah. It's astounding. 200 million women used it the first year. I mean, that's knowing what your customers want. That's a relationship. So it's not the store. It's not the makeup. It's the relationship that Sephora has with you that they know how you feel and how to access your emotions. And they intertwine it with what they do. So it's not a retail store anymore. It's a relationship with the customer that you must find out what you can do about it and what that relationship is for you. The reality is that technology now stimulates and in fact simulates intimacy. So the very thing that Sam Marcus could do or Mr. Bloomingdale could do on the floor of the store, technology can do if it's harnessed to that purpose. And for many years, it wasn't. For many years, technology was its own end result. It was an iPhone. That was the end of the concept of the iPhone, was Steve Jobs comes up with the iPhone. I've got an iPhone, he sells an iPhone. What the iPhone is and what mobile is to every relationship in the world today is not what was the original concept of the iPhone. It may have been Steve Jobs' idea where it could go, but certainly it's not how we thought it when we first bought our first iPhones or our first mobile. We didn't think about all the things that could be at our fingertips through this product. And the problem is, the reason we didn't think about it is because we're too busy with our lives and we're too busy with what irritates us and what aggravates us. And without getting into any discussions about anything that's going on in the world today, irritation destroys intimacy. So the moment you have irritation in the relationship, and you all can discuss your partners, what irritates you most about your partners. You all know. Okay? Now, retailers didn't worry about what irritated the customers. They were just doing what they did because they could do it. 10 stores, 50 stores, 100 stores, 1,000 stores. Growing, I was part of it. Growing, building stores, opening stores was really exciting. Didn't have to worry about last year's sales because opening 10, 20 more stores. It was, it was exciting, it was insane. I mean, most of the clients I worked with in my career went from seven to 10 to 100 to 1,000 stores. It was, it was, and it was only within a decade or two decades. It wasn't like, uh, it didn't take that. So the, the problem is that customers want to waste their time. They don't mind going out there or shopping, not buying something. It's on their own time. But you waste their time and they are really pissed. And that's the thing. Now Starbucks was in trouble was not getting same store sales, was really kind of losing its luster. And everybody was kind of speaking about, is this the end of Starbucks? Because it was really not working anymore. What they discovered was the irritation of a Starbucks customer every time walking into the store, ordering the same order, taking the credit card out, paying the same way, and then waiting to get it. Why am I doing this every time? They get an app, 
You join the app, you put your name down, your credit card's right on, you call ahead you, with your app, you, you, you text ahead, you get there, it's paid for, you, it's the Morris, it's right there, you pick it up, you leave. Basically, the whole process of same store sales, the whole growth in same store sales last year came from users of that app. So it's, it's again, it's understanding what the irritation is and using technology to get rid of the irritation. So more and more you'll hear through this whole presentation is, is harnessing technology for the benefit of your customers rather than just to make, your, make more money. Now here's a little um, clip of the newest technology. It's a little long, but I want you to kind of see this is what's actually launching as we speak in supermarkets across North America. In Canada, one of the major supermarkets has just put this into all their stores. It's functioning as we speak right now and is again moving along the process of how I stay in business and keep my clients and keep my customers happy. The app has taken over into Best Buy. Uh, Nordstrom, I won't talk a lot about tonight, but it's one of my absolute favorite stories right now. They are the guys that are making it work. Um, they're, they're, they just opened actually a 320,000 square foot women's store on 57th in New York. That's chutzpah, that's guts, that's courage, that's believing. And, and, and Bob Nordstrom says, I have a passion for the store that I still feel and of course, they have three floors of shoes. Why not? It's Nordstrom. Um, they also have a bar called the Shoe Bar, where you can actually, as Nordstrom said, I can't imagine why we didn't put shoes and alcohol together a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to play you a commercial right now, which is the, I, I, I created the phrase store as a brand and, and sold branding for retailers for years and got retailers to believe that branding built the relationship. Today, technology is part of that branding. It's still, though, important to have that emotional relationship. So yes, you can use the technology, and I'll show you a lot of examples of the technology functionally keeping the relationship, but you still have to find a way to get into the hearts and minds and the emotions of your customers in a way that your competition isn't. That still, that branding still has value. Nordstrom's just launched a campaign that I think is purely brilliant. And this is one of a series of about 20 different commercials they did. Uh, Look at me. Mean what you say. Give it back to her. I want to have a human experience. Who are you in this sculpture? Three and nine, good job. Connect with each other. Find the passion. You look nervous, what's wrong? Kinda am. Make your place, take your spot. Find yourself. Good, embody your power. Be a big bear. Think of who you are in the sculpture. An open mind is the best look. I think an absolutely brilliant uh, positioning. And again, for Nordstrom to stand out from the crowd and be its 
unique self and attract to it unique customers who think that way. It's brave, it's passionate, it's an understanding of where they are. Target, again, another company in trouble over the last decade, I think it had 12 consecutive quarters of down sales or whatever number was, couldn't find its way. Finally, under a new president has turned the corner and it launched its new loyalty program in, I think it was fall, October somewhere. 35 million signed up right away. Actually, it's 50 million as we speak today. And it really streamlines the relationship at the checkout with the loyalty, the credit card and everything. It, it, it's, when you look at it now and you look at the simplicity of how it works, you said, what took them so long? But it's hard to do these things and it's hard to get the management and the leadership to understand how to work with the retailer's needs, get rid of the irritations, find all the ways that everything you do fits together. It's hard work. In Canada, we have a uh, supermarket called Loblaws and a drugstore called Shoppers Drug Mart, which are the largest in the country. We have 35 million people in Canada. Uh, 18 million joined PC Optum, which is the loyalty program, which is 60% of all adult population. So a massive penetration. Uh, they can communicate with their customers, again, the same thing as Target, the same thing as Nordstrom, in a way that was unknown before. But again, the branding comes in. How do I keep the love alive that makes me different? Find the love, find the love. It's, 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 you can understand that they get their customers' issues. Now, there are millions of people who happen to also have a love affair with bricks and mortar and timber and paint and tile and find you know, that pretty sexy. Uh, I've been fortunate to be a, a part of the home improvement business pretty well my whole career. Uh, home Depot and Lowe's are great, great retailers and they own half of the U.S. home improvement business. But in Canada, we have a thousand independent dealers called Home Hardware that have been able to maintain, grow from 100 when I first got the client decades ago, uh, maintain a 30% share, which is exactly the same share as Depot has, and Depot is, sourced, is, is stored out. It can't open any more stores. There's room for 180 big box Home Depots, 180 Lowe's. Lowe's is only at 60 so far, so they've got some growth. But in Canada, the small independent has been able to compete because uh, of an attitude that says, I'm in it with you. You're my, I'm an owner of the store. You're an owner of a home. We're in this together. There's a pride that comes with home ownership. It's a pride that doesn't stand still because your home is your place to gather and grow, to maintain with special care. Always a dream on the horizon. At Home Hardware, we share that pride because we are owners too. We've built our home by helping millions of Canadians build theirs. Home Hardware and Building Center locations. Homeowners helping homeowners with expert advice for 50 years and counting. So again, find the common relationship, find the love, find the emotional connection. Ace, of course, has 4,400 stores in the States and is virtually saying the same strategy. But the robots are getting more lovable and more ubiquitous. You want to make your home better. Our job is to help you. So we're building new tools that help our associates help you better. We partnered with fellow robots to bring you Lobot. We spent close to two years honing Loba, and soon it'll be coming to select Lowe's stores to help you. Hi, I'm looking for some paint. 
Need to find something? Loba can show you, and in multiple languages. Loba also helps our team by constantly monitoring inventory, giving us daily feedback about what is in stock in the store. All of this allows our staff to focus on what they do best, helping you. Again, get the connection. Now Lowe's just partnered, or is partnering essentially just with Google, um, who I am a, a big, uh, I'm in awe of what Google and, and Facebook and, and uh, uh, others have done. But they're partnering with, with Google with 88,000 mobile units now in the Lowe's stores, connected to Google's cloud using Android phones, systems, so that everything in the Lowe's warehouse and in the store is at the fingertips of each associate on the floor. So when they're serving you on the floor and they need any information about anything to do with Lowe's, they can remain contact with you, still have eye contact, still have a relationship, and get their answer right away on their mobile unit. Again, part of harnessing the technology to service the relationship. And the other part of the whole relationship and the love affair is it's never been easier to show your love. I mean, social media and mobile are literally made for, for romance and in fact being a very big part of the romantic uh, growth of the last generation. I mean, how, where would everybody be without texting their dates or everything like that and, and, and the relationship? So retailers had, were a little late to the process, but we were fortunate that people like Facebook and Google had thought it through for us and brought us in the solutions for us to use. Only one word of warning, as many, many of you know, love isn't always what it appears, okay? Uh, fake Instagram followers. Ellen generous, 58% of her followers are fake. Kate Perry, 53%. Courtney Kardashian, 49%. Arena and Miley, 44%. So it's not all what it seems. And that's one of the real problems with all of this is not everything is what it seems. So you have to really be smart in how you connect with all of this stuff to use it properly because it can take... Now, it does work. And Kylie is the first 21-year-old billionaire in America in history. And 175 million followers will buy anything she is selling. So again, the connection, this is a relationship. It's with Kylie and her customers. They're not buying some abstract concept. They're buying physical things that Kylie says will you know, make their life better. It works. Google is brilliant in its search process. And everybody who's advertising understands the power of a Google search word and buying a word and owning a word so you pop up first in the search. It, it seemed so elementary when it started. And I never really understood their uh, slogan when they started, which I think was do no evil. I think that was the slogan. I, what the heck are they talking about? Now we understand how evil the fake news or everything like that. We understand how evil all of this stuff can be. And as I said, all the fake followers and everything like that. There is evil inside the technology. So you have to be able to uh, find out uh, or, or, be, or be cautious, be, be vigilant. So when you're getting married, you start looking for the gowns, everything like that. Up pops David's bridal. Bit louder. Something back. old. Something new. Something borrowed. Okay. Something blue. And above all else, something you. Only at David's Bridal. Okay, got it loud for the end. Now, I was fortunate enough, um, I had a good friend in Philadelphia who just uh, got involved in this seven store chain, David's Bridal, and begged me to get involved with him and help him with the retail marketing. I am busy. I'm not interested. Um, I was phasing out of the business. So this is, anyway, this forced me into uh, getting involved with them uh, in the late 90s. And I, 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 instead of taking any money from him, I acted as CMO and he gave me shares in the company. 
Anyway, it grew to over 300 stores, over 25% share of the bridal market, and we went public in 1999. Uh, brilliant. Uh, the concept worked, everything was wonderful. Uh, then, in 2000, we sold to Macy's, or actually to May Company, which then bought by Macy's, for about uh, uh, four, uh, four million. 2006, Macy's sold it to Leonard Green. Uh, we don't know for how much, because it wasn't a public transaction. But Leonard Green in 2012 sold it for close to a billion. Same exact 300 stores. They, they, they hadn't grown any in, the, in that period of time. And then in 2018, they declared bankruptcy. And in 2019, they emerged from bankruptcy. So that's the sordid story. And the reason for this sordid story is that paying more interest to your banks than your customers is grounds for divorce. And that is the story of the last decade or more with the hedge funds and retail. Uh, it, you know, if you are, it, it was a story about the allied and federated department stores. Again, they went into bankruptcy, they got bought out for the real estate. It's happening right now with Saks, Lord & Taylor, et cetera. When you get involved in retail for the real estate, for the finance, the Sears, the rest of my case, it doesn't work. The relationship is with customers, it's not with the real estate or with the banks. So if you don't get that, you can't succeed in retail. Doesn't matter how financially you manipulate the situation, it won't last. You may get more money out of it for yourself, which is your objective, that's fine. That's, that was your objective, get more money out of it. But to be a good retailer, it does not work. If you're paying more interest to the banks or the hedge funds or to, uh, to Eddie, then it, it's, it's not gonna work. The other uh, reward for a relationship, first of all is marriage, then comes the pregnancy, usually, not always. Not necessarily, this, just, this is a politically correct speech. Um, and, and Americans are really good at making babies. It's a, it's a good industry, four million a year, pretty well for the last decade, every year. It's, it's a license to print money, or a license to have babies. Uh, and how could you screw this up? Well, Toys R Us and Babies R Us figured it out. They figured out how to blow the, blow the best relationship opportunity in retailing. The baby is being born, I make a relationship with you, I've got you as a customer for life. At the very moment you are the most loving, caring, wonderful human being, I'm the store you trust, I'm with you. No, you're not, because you're paying too much money to the hedge funds that just took it over. Bankruptcy. Uh, by the way, you'll be glad to know you no longer have to get married or even anything to have COVID. You can now go on to Modamity, Modamity, sorry, Modamity, Right now, it's a new, new app, and you can find someone to co-parent with you. <laughs> Seriously. Afterwards, you can do this. It's marvelous. It's going to change the whole romantic concept I'm talking about today. It's finished. Um, the other thing is, being single isn't that bad if you're Chinese. So 11-11, and in the question and answer period, you may ask me for the background of this if you want to, if you're so interested. But this is Singles Day, 11th of November, in China, and it's historically the day that bachelors all celebrate being bachelors. So Alibaba decided to make it a sale day. Why not? It is now the biggest single sale day in the world. And of course, it was launched with a live concert by, by uh, Taylor Swift. Now, mind you, what isn't launched by a live concert by Taylor Swift? Uh, and they did 30, to, uh, 30 billion in sales. To give you an idea, 2017, Cyber Monday and Black Friday in the US was 10 billion. Okay, so it's three times Black Friday, everything in, in, in one day. Um, and talk about love. Now this is kind of the, the uh, getting close to the halfway point. Um, who knew free shipping was such an aphrodisiac? Jeff Bezos got it. Read the Everything Store. Best book in business you can read, in my opinion. How he figured this out is this Wall Street banker and, and did this is, is wonderful reading, but it's also what we are all benefiting from today. The, the big battle today is Amazon versus Walmart, and it's a battle, it's a romantic story as good as, as, as Helen of Troy and, and, and all of, the, of all of these stories. It is, it is really a passion of two great organizations you know, really finding ways to up the other to win the, to win the romance, to win the girl, to win the, to win the customer. And it's marvelous. You've got to remember Amazon, big in e-commerce, but small in retail. It's only 5% of all retail. 
And revenue-wise, Amazon's 200 billion, Walmart's 500 billion. I'm focusing on just the two because I am, in, in, I am just passionate about what's going on right now. And to me, it's the world we live in and the world we will be living in for the next uh, decade or so. So Amazon comes out, e-commerce, destroys, disrupts the whole retail world. Everybody runs scared, everybody doesn't know what to do, including Walmart, who basically ignored it to begin with. It's this little upstart selling stuff online. What's the big deal? You know, we've got three, 4,000 stores. Nah, I'm not interested. Did nothing. Okay, we should do something. So it hired Amazon actually to fulfill their online orders. That was how they started. Both Target and Amazon hired Amazon, both Target and Walmart hired Amazon to fulfill their first email online business. Anyway, then suddenly someone at Walmart woke up and said, he's gonna really put us out of business if we allow him to go this way. We better do something. And a, a, series, a series of incredibly brilliant presidents one by one came up with a strategy. First of all, they said, forget about, pull it back to ourselves. We're gonna do the same thing as Amazon. Get louder, please, Zach. Back. So this was the first uh, attack. Walmart's now saying, we're going after Amazon. We're going to do two, free two-day shopping, no membership fees, no $99 for Prime, all of this stuff. And it, it's, it's works. It's doing pretty good. Then another bright president comes in and said, you know, we want to be ourselves. We've got 4,000 stores. And we are the largest grocer in the country, two and a half times the closest. What are we playing in the ballpark for? And then... Amazon makes a huge mistake, in my opinion, that we'll look in the next decade, and buys Whole Foods. It wasn't a mistake for Amazon, but it really scared the heck out of Walmart and said, they're coming after this huge business. We own this market. No one gets to play in our playground. We're, that's it. I'm finished. Enough of being Mr. Nice Guy. And they basically can deliver next day to 75 of the U.S. population. And, you know, they really are huge players in food. And the bright, the light that went on in Walmart's head office that said, we are going to be not just the biggest in food, we're going to be the best in food. And we're going to take everything that Amazon's doing, everything that they're, they, we're going to learn from that, and we're going to beat them. And we're going to invest billions in being the best in that. Same day curbside pickup. It's called now B-O-P-I-S, buy online, pick up a store. And it sounds like it's a big deal now, but it was an incredibly big deal when they came up with it because it hadn't yet been perceived of as the right answer. So people are still thinking of delivery as the right answer. Walmart has 5,000 stores within 10 miles of 90% of the population. Top, uh, Amazon will never have that. Will never in a million, a million years, never. So now Walmart suddenly starts acting like Walmart, which is when they first became Walmart, they destroyed everybody by being Walmart, not by being some copy of something. So Whole Foods only has 479 stores. So they picked a fight with the big bully. And on the, they'll, they'll do okay. I'm not worried about Amazon. But what I'm amazed at is how brilliant Walmart changed its whole organization, and right now they're opening, as we speak, two robotic warehouses to supply this. But this is my favorite TV.
what's happening. It's the future, Michael. Oh, I'm not Michael. Oh, don't worry. He calls everyone Michael. <laughs> I think it's just brilliant. Just brilliant. Um, Walmart will, by the way, soon deliver to your fridge. They have all the stuff. You can just get into your house, put it in your fridge. It won't cook for you yet, but that's coming. Um, now, just a little word about Amazon, again, who's not necessarily shrinking back into the woodwork and forgetting about being in retail. They are disrupting everything still. They are the biggest in web services. If any of you watch any of the football games on the last weekend, you saw all the AWS uh, tech uh, stats and showing how the play was organized, all done with, with AWS. Um, and they own 25% of the smart speaker business, which is almost double what uh, Google owns, and Google really started it. Uh, so again, they are lying back on any level. They just keep going at it. Some of that's going to hurt them because they're not focused enough on, on the one big thing anymore, but they're doing everything well. And uh, this is another thing that's going on absolutely as we speak. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. It's a wonderful world out there. Now, Amazon is also fast becoming the number one apparel retailer in America. It's kind of a really strange thing that happened, mainly through uh, Amazon Prime Wardrobe, which has actually been very successful. Um, you just order what you like, six items, uh, they ship it to you, you ship back what you don't want to wear. It's that simple. We would like to offer you the position. You got the job. A bit louder. Who's the Houston? <laughs> I gotta get some clothes. Hi, I'm Derek. Oh, is it Casual Friday? Sorry, guys. I think we can leverage this opportunity. Does anyone know the dial-in? Oh, thanks, sir. I, uh, I like your pants, too. Now, department stores have been the ones suffering through all this, with Walmart's growth, Target's growth, uh, Amazon's growth. Uh, the, the, the department store business is really in a bit of a bad shape. As you can see from the market share, 9.5% in 80, 5% in uh, 2005, and last year, only 1.2%. A lot of that's due to the fact that they're closing a lot of stores because they're not paying off, but a lot of it's just due to the fact that they're just not relevant. We grew up... You know, Burdines was your store. It, that was, you had a relationship with Burdines, a credit card, everything. And over the years, uh, they didn't keep the love. Didn't, the love didn't last. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, some of which I've explained today. Uh, they had the opportunity to do all of these things before anybody. They could have done order online, pick up in store. They, could have, they had the customers. The department stores owned the market, but no longer.
the people like Nordstrom's are surviving because they're adapting the, uh, and, and, and growing into their specialty, but they're really becoming an overgrown specialty store. That's it. In Canada, uh, TJ Maxx is the other apparel retailer that's doing brilliantly against everybody, Amazon, department stores, uh, every, with the daily treasure hunt, finding what you like, finding a good buy, is still very, very sexy. In Canada, uh, they own Winners, HomeSense, and Marshalls, three different brands, but they're all owned by TJ Maxx, and they've come up with the most innovative technology you can imagine, and here it is. This holiday, experience the game-changing retail innovation we call offline shopping. Our cutting-edge human search engine uncovers hyper-real savings. Enjoy immediate multi-sensory feedback to discover the perfect gift. And take advantage of our instant add-to-cart technology. Plus, don't pay for shipping. There is no shipping. Save in real time all the time with offline shopping at Winners, HomeSense, and Marshalls, where you could win your gifts. Okay. Again, so you go to full extreme, it works. And IKEA uh, is a you know Swedish uh, retailer that has conquered the world, and with a concept of serving their customers a unique way and a unique customer. As they say, love is complicated. IKEA is simple, and simple is really what they sell. I'm going to play you a spot right now, which is an iconic spot, only because I like it, not because it necessarily means anything. <laughs> Many of you feel happy for this lamp. That's not crazy. Reusing things is much better. Actually, this is a remake last year of an iconic IKEA spot, which is the same lamp, is left out in the street, and he comes on and says, many of you are feeling sad for this lamp. You're crazy. <laughs> it's just a lamp, and besides, New ones are better. So, um, so again, they remain true to the relationship. You can feel the love. You can feel the continuity. They're now, by the way, uh, moving into the cities with smaller stores. They tried pickup stores to try and uh, change the game and not have just these big uh, monster warehouses. It didn't work. They're closing the pickup stores. So now they're trying newer city-wide, city, city side stores. And of course, if all else fails. A conspicuous, conspicuous show of wealth has been known to attract the other sex. I, it's worked for me. Um, and and, and uh, uh, any one of you who've seen the new uh, Restoration Hardware stores has to say, what was he thinking? What is he thinking? But we went to, we went to the opening of the new store in Palm Beach, and all of you Miami hipsters were all there, including Matthew Con McConaughey. Um, I guess he's not a Miami hipster, but he's a hipster. Um, anyway, again, there's n n many different ways to earn the love and to keep the love. And basically, I just want to caution you as we end that love hurts. It's not easy. It's not something that comes with all beds of roses and flowers and, 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 and nice good songs uh, by Michael Bolton. Um, but Customers, I hate to break it to you, are seeing other stores. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to have to live with it. The CEO of a retailer now has to be a marriage counselor. They have to understand this relationship. 
That's where I so uh, in awe of the Walmart leadership and stuff like that is they're getting their understanding that this is a love affair that we have to take care of. We have to maintain the relationship. We can't just be retailers and, and wear our suits. Um, so we have to reignite the romance. And the great news is, of course, is that all you need is love. Thank you. That's it. All right, Morris, that was a really wonderful, uh, wonderful tour, wonderful visual uh, tour, and um, integrating so many co corporations uh, into your theme. I thought it was spectacular. Um, we're we're going to open it up directly for uh, questions. So. Um, because it's a new year, I have to remind you that um, a question is a single sentence ends <laughs> with a question mark, okay? Some of you may have forgotten that over the holidays, but uh, who, who would like to get us underway? Do we have anyone uh, who will kick us off? Yeah, please. Uh, wait for the mic if you wouldn't mind. So if we can get the mics around pretty quickly, please. Thank you. Thank you. So what about the love? that's either coming from or going into the um, outlet malls, the stores in the outlet malls, and especially the high-end outlets? It's the same relationship. You're going to that outlet because you have a relationship with that brand. So there's, there's a, a process going on. That, well, it's been going on for a while. You know, the department stores, basically, is where you went to for brands. When I started in business, the brands the Ralph Lorenz, whatever, they pioneered stores in the store and you could only get that brand at the department store and that's why you went to the department store. So it was a, uh, when I started my career, I was, I was teaching Macy's and Bloomingdale's how to be brands themselves because they become a store of brands, not the brand itself. So people, and, and what happened the, the reality was that the brands did pull away from the department stores and opened up their own stores to compete with the department stores. And so now across the world, you have these luxury brands. I don't know how many have opened up in Coral Gables, but, but the luxury brands opening massive stores all around the country so that you go to those stores first and don't go to the department store for that brand. The off-brands, the outlets, are a version of that of taking the, the Nike, the, uh, the Gucci or whatever, and offering you that merchandise off price. So it's the same relationship, just a layer, but same as TJ Maxx. You, you get your Ted Baker jacket, which my son bought me uh, for, for my birthday, at the outlet store, but it's a Ted Baker jacket. And so the, the, the brand's relationship with the customer remains through the different selling techniques. But uh, the luxury brands in particular are brilliant, Tiffany, uh, brilliant at holding you to that relationship. And if you want to pay off price, they'll be, they'll be fine. They're not, they're not offended. Okay. Well, one, of the, um, one of the most famous people in uh, the history of retailing is uh, Malcolm McNair, who uh, right. was a professor with whom you studied at yeah. one point. Um, Explain what, what the wheel of retailing is that Malcolm came up with. Uh, Do you see that evidence? Yeah, well, Professor um, lectured at the Harvard School of Retail, which I was lucky enough that my boss at the time, a uh, retail chain in Canada, sent me for six weeks every summer for three years to study with him. Because at that time, in the uh, early 60s, retail marketing was, didn't exist. But 
for, for Professor Bonner, it did. And he came up with a cycle of retailing concept. He was teaching it, which you start off with the peddler going around door to door. The peddler says, this is too hard on my feet. I'm opening up a store. I opened up a small general store in, in the uh, little town. And the general store did well. And then a guy across the road says, he's selling um, shoes. He shouldn't be. I'm going to open a shoe store. And then the shoe store opened. And then the clothing store opened. And then the hardware store opened. And then along comes a guy and says, you know, we should put all this together in a department store. You get this cycle of retailing along, and then along comes uh, Leslie Wexner and says, you know, we should take clothing and we should take it out and put it in a limited selection in its own store. And then Victoria's Secret comes along, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then along comes Amazon. So this whole cycle of retailing is, is, is going on to this day. And his, his prescience in, in, in understanding that without knowing anything about what I talked about today. And, you know, nothing existed when I was going there. But the concept of thinking existed. You know, w w one, one thing that often happens in markets is that uh, an entrepreneur will come in at the low end of a market and see a niche yes. opportunity. Yeah. There's a low price uh, point that he or she can target. Yeah. And then over time, they just get a little bit enamored of getting on the cocktail party circuit. Yeah. And yeah. so they really don't want to be the low price right. retailer in town. Yeah. They want to be a little higher end. And that leaves a gap for someone else Absolutely. to come Always. in underneath, Always. right? How is it that Walmart has stayed true to the fundamental tenets that Sam Walton brought to well, you the party for so many decades? You said it. Two words, Sam Walton. Um, he fully understood the role of Walmart in the cycle. And he understood and ingrained in, in um, his people, uh, and it's lived on, to be true to themselves. I, I, I reflected a little bit there about how they kind of didn't want to go into e-commerce because it wasn't what they did. And then they tried to copy someone else because they didn't know what to do. And finally, they got back to being what they were and doing what they knew how to do. As long as Walmart goes back to being what its roots are, and, and no matter how big they are, they stay true to those roots. It works. And nobody, nobody I, I, I mentioned earlier that I was very fortunate to meet Sam, Sam uh, Walton early in my career. Um, about the same time, I was, I was speaking at a conference in Atlanta. I'm landing at the airport, and uh, I get a cab to go to Peachtree Plaza. And the guy says to me, uh, can I show you a cab? And it was Sam Walton. Uh, and, and we became friends because I was speaking about basically what I'm speaking about now, which he had never really uh, spoken. He didn't speak about very much about what he was doing, didn't want anyone to know. Um, but he was, um, he, he invited me back to uh, Bentonville and I went through the uh, stores. I came back and told my, my, my boss, stores are terrible. They're ugly, they're dirty, they're, they're just. They're just nothing. I said, but the warehouse, I don't know. I've never seen it. And, and Sam told me about automatic replenishment, which I didn't know from Adam. I was a marketing guy, automatic replenishment. That was tech. But the concept of automatic replenishment, of the technology at that, that time, to not be out of stock of basics ever, ever, not just one day, one hour, ever, still true. Still true. Okay. More questions. Yes, uh, Angel. Uh uh, we'll go down here first, please. Second row. Thanks. And then we'll uh, come over here. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned real estate in, in, right. in the comments. And I was curious. And last week, I guess, Bloomingdale's and yeah. some other stores announced closing. Yeah. What does a future mall look like to you? What's, what, what, what are we going to be going to the mall? Okay. Uh, good question. And I wish I could answer completely. And I'm investing that right now. Um, first of all, the shopping centers as we knew it, as we know it, grew up in the big ones, grew up in the era of anchors. You had Sears on one side, Bedines on the other side, whatever. It was, but the, if you couldn't get the right anchors, you couldn't build the mall, basically. And then everybody went into the mall, especially stores, because they were assured of the traffic created by those big anchors. So that's the mentality of the shopping center. The specialty stores grew, 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 grew out of that uh, ex expansion of stores by the department stores, by the Sears. Uh, that stopped. It's dead in the water. So what you have now is different 
approaches to malt. Uh, and most of that is going to be um, mixed use as opposed to single use. It's going to be very experiential versus only retail. Uh, all of the online uh, brands need now, they found they need a retail outlet because again, the one-on-one -on -one is more meaningful than the, the, the online. So a lot of the direct consumer brands are now opening up stores. So there's now a lot of opportunity for new stores to be in. The luxury market is still growing. Yorkdale in Toronto, which was actually the first enclosed shopping center in, in, the, in North America, uh, had Eaton's and the Bay. Eaton's is no longer in business, but the space that is Eaton's is now taken up by H&M, Zara, uh, Old Navy, et cetera, in the same mall as Versace, et cetera. So the, the eclectic mix of luxury, of fast fashion, of, of cheesecake factory, uh, and everything like that, that's the new mall. So it, it, now, it, it's, it leasing-wise and, 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 and um, uh, storefront-wise is a much more difficult marketing strategic approach than the old way. Because the old way basically was, was got very, I, I, one of my clients in Canada was, was um, Dialects, which owned every specialty retailer in the country every men's, ladies, ch children's, jeans, et cetera. When a mall opened, we had 20 stores in that mall. And, we, and, and, and basically that was it, that's how we grew. Opening a mall, 20 stores, opening a mall, that just doesn't work anymore. So, but, so the, the strategic marketing of the mall and how you manage the leasing now makes a difference. So it's, it's harder today, it requires some more imagination but there's a lot of retailers out there and restauranters and, and as I said, direct consumer that require the outlet, uh, the, the, the retail connection to stay in business. What, what, what are the goods uh, that are, if any, most immune from online? Is there anything that's safe from no. online? No, nothing safe. I mean, got, and if you're in retail today, you've got to be paranoid. Uh, as as um, the guy from Intel was it said, only the paranoid survive. Um, that is true of retail. Only the paranoid survive. It's it's coming at me. It's going to hit me. I got to get there ahead of it. it. It's it's true. So there's nothing. You know, we thought uh, my intense involvement in the home improvement business. We thought for years that you know, they're not going to buy lumber online. Well, so happens they are. Because what they're going to do is go on the, on the app from the depot or Lowe's or home. They're going to order on the line and you're going to take your truck and pick it up from the store. You're going to buy online and pick it up at the store. That is, so, it's, it, so every retailer is facing a blurred line when it comes to being online, retail, stores, factory, off, off price, whatever. It's all blurred. And you, you kind of um, stay true to yourself, but it's, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated stuff. Hi, Zach. That was a great lecture. Thank you. Okay. And um, you talk about love with the brands. And we, we do have great companies with lots of great brands like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, like ABI. Do you see these companies going actually forward to the retail using the amount of brands that they have? trying to sell it together to, to be a, on the last mile to the customer? To be less? The last mile, so they, they will be in the retail as well as... as retail. Okay, it's a very good question and I can't give you an absolute answer. There are two issues in the, uh, the P&G brand world, which we'll kind of use as an example. And the, the biggest thing is private brands. So every major food chain, food retailer, Walmart, has private brands. And the private brands are the fastest growing piece of their business. In many cases, those private brands are made for them by the P&Gs, et cetera. So there is a somewhat, um, again, a blurred line. Um, it is harder and harder for a brand that's distributed through other retailers to maintain its leadership in the marketplace. Only the very best and the biggest will survive in my mind. 
I think it's almost impossible to be a, uh, a national brand, a packaged goods item, and maintain that brand leadership as you could originally. Because you could buy it with advertising before. If you know the, the, the Coca-Colas, you know, they, they, they owned their market share through their share of, share of mind. You thought of them first. You know, the idea was if you got three times, uh, if you got a three times hit on TV a week, it would be top of your mind. When you went into the, sh into the uh, supermarket, you'd think Coke. That was basically the old way. It doesn't work that way anymore. There's off brands. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, um, a whole aisle of different brands in there. So it, it's virtually a losing battle. It's not going to go out of business. Procter & Gamble's not going out of business anytime soon. But they're going to get more and more of their business from making the product for retailers. That's my opinion. It's not by any means necessarily true. So in other words, they're going to be cannibalizing themselves yes. or they're going to be uh, yes. just losing yeah. revenue. Yeah, they're going to have to keep the factories running. Right. Exactly. And to keep the factories running is, is I make the make the private brand. A uh, couple more quick ones and then we'll... Uh, uh, take a break, and uh, I think there's some refreshments outside. Uh, let's go here first, and then we'll go to you. Uh, keep them brief. Uh, maybe we'll have two or three questions okay. in a row asked okay. you again as well, and then uh, Morris will Glad answer all three. Okay. Um, regarding Amazon, do you are you particularly find a concern regarding the fact that as Amazon continues to expand in technology, and as the quality of technology increases the quality of human to human customer relationship within it, Amazon tends is trending to decrease. Okay. So that, yes. So this gentleman here, just uh, while we have you here. Yes, go ahead. Ask it. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So you spoke a lot when answering his question about how these like e commerce companies are starting to open their own stores. Right. Something I've also realized is how these e-commerce companies are starting to reach the consumer through like these pop-ups. Yes. Do you feel that that's an effective strategy or eventually you have to open up a store? Okay, good question. Okay, I'll start with the Amazon. We take those two and uh, take the mic over. Okay, over. so um, Amazon, you know, there was an expose of the Amazon work ethic and the Amazon uh, working uh, situation, uh, uh, intensity. It's an intense organization. It's a paranoid organization and it has to be. There is, there's no room in retail, and I'll use Amazon in the big retail world, for the faint of heart. This is not a game. This is a tough, rough, dirty business. You know, only the roughest, toughest, dirtiest are going to survive. We're not in the business to be nice. Our relationship with the customer is where we're nice. We can be sweet and wonderful. Now, can the culture of the company be brutal and still be courteous and nice to the customer is, I think, your question. And that's the question that I can't answer yet. I would, I would lay arms that the cultural changes in every corporation are improving. And I would say that the concern about the culture and the concern about being um, good employees and good employers is a real issue that's being faced by everybody. And the Me Too movement is part of that. It's part of how do we treat people better? How do we treat people nicer? So that's going to be, um, I, you know, I can't predict exactly, but my feeling is that, is, is that the HR role is going to play an increasingly important role in the culture, which will spread out to the customer. As far as pop-ups, brilliant. Pop-ups have become the hottest new uh, idea, especially for direct consumers uh, businesses. And most of the department stores now surviving on pop-ups uh, because they're coming in and doing great business. Also, one other thing just to add to you, the pop-up is, is, is very successful. It kind of does have a somewhat limited lifestyle, but I, I can't tell you what that is. The, the other uh, interesting um, uh, opportunity, I'll come to that something. We'll talk about it. Okay. okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. When you have a business model that's proven to be successful, how do you adjust and reinvent yourself as opposed to growing complacent? Going into the basement? As opposed to becoming complacent, which is the same. Okay, uh, first of all, um, <laughs> same thing. 
first of all, again, I go back to marriage. Now, most of you are too young to be married, so. Um, but anyway, all of us that are married know that keeping a marriage healthy and alive takes a lot of work, a lot of intensity, and every day you're on trial. Every day you get, we're in the morning, does it last another day? Um, it's not, it, do, it doesn't feel that way necessarily, but I want to tell you, you don't keep up your side of the bargain, yeah, there's all that. That is true of business, of any business. There is no absolute divine right of success or sustenance of, of, in any company. If you are taking care of your customers, and if you don't understand your customers, and you are talking to them and, and believing it, doing the research, analyzing the irritations, saying, how can I solve that? Daily, literally, it's every day, everywhere, all the time, only the paranoid survive. There is no other way. There's no genius that's suddenly got a magic answer. It's just doing the hard work every day. Okay, let, let's stay. I think there was one more uh, over here, and we don't want to shortchange uh, the okay. lady here. Wait for the mic, if you wouldn't mind, please. Okay. Give it to the young lady first. Thank you. <laughs> um, what are the new Walmart neighborhood markets that are going automated completely? Yeah. Doing to the rest of the, the market, like Publix and... Win Dixie and all that because I, I I happened to walk into one the other day and it was like the coolest thing. Everything was automated. Yeah, it's like the Amazon Go. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. So what is that going to do to Publix and all that? Again, it's an evolution. It won't happen overnight. But the smart cart I showed you earlier is the answer for the Publix to compete with the uh, smart store. So there, there's there's a, there's there are there are technologies technological solutions, and, and you know, be quite honest, the relationship you have with your uh, supermarket is, is somewhat intimate. You know, it, it really, you do care about where you shop and the, you like their food, their fresh food. Fresh food happens to be the frontier that everyone's gonna fight over right now. Getting fresh food, food to your door delivered for free is where the battle is being fought as we speak. Uh, I can't give you the answer, but all of these things are going to change the supermarket as we know it. And it will not be 10 years from now as we know it now. Okay. Um, Last question goes to the city of Coral Gables. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. So a little bit more on pop-ups, please, because Francesca, the city, the chamber, and yeah. others are curating a pop-up that's going to open in the middle of the spring. We've given very favorable terms to, obviously, folks. They apply for the program. It's going to end up being a gallery. Um, I'd love to hear what others are doing because I think this, for us, is a great way that we've been incubating some okay. new brands on yeah. Miracle Mile. Okay. My position on pop-ups may not be the normal one, but I believe the pop-up's greatest strength is in brands that already have a following. Okay? So when you've got Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop, she's got the following. Her pop-up, guaranteed success. It's a, it's a big event. So I believe pop-ups are best used when they are in a, a retail, a real-world expression of something that only lives in the ether right now. So that's as a, one rule. The, the other part of that is that the, um, the, the pop-up can be very effective in what I think is the biggest new trend, which is the reselling, the remarketing, uh, of, of old cl of clothes, like thread up, just made a deal with Macy's. Um, so the remarketing of clothes is actually, I can't remember the numbers, but something like a six, potentially a $60 billion business. Okay, so that's a big opportunity because there's no real retail of used clothing of the new generation of used clothing. And yet real, real thread up are big successes. So again, on pop-ups, bringing to life what's existing online, to me, is still the biggest opportunity. Um, and and uh, you know, I, to a point earlier, we talked about luxury goods, Ralph Lauren was original pop-up at Basis. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, you're doing it all wrong. I want to take control. I want this wall of color. You know? and, and so, so pop-ups, to me, work best when you're utilizing a brand or name that's already in existence online and has a following that can come to that 
very unique uh, thing. I agreed with everything you said, except that I can tell you that no self-respecting taxpayer in the city of Coral Gables would ever, ever wear used clothes. <laughs> Good place to end this. Morris, <laughs> thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific.